currently is 29%, among girls it's 23%, as compared to 9 and 18% respectively among non-Hispanic whites. When you look at those statistics in Imperial County, which is one of the places where I work, which is about two hours east of here, the statistics are about 50%. Um, the issue with that, and I didn't want to put a lot of statistics up there because you can find those on the CDC website, but the reason why this is so important is that a child that's six years old and that is obese pretty much can guarantee that they're going to be an obese adult, which has huge um, health care consequences, huge implications in terms of their morbidity and mortality, life expectancy, and so on. So it's a real, a real issue. Um, Obesity is obviously a multi-determined um, uh, health outcome. Uh, you know, you can look at it from a genetic perspective, you can look at it from an environmental perspective. What I really look at is from a health behavior perspective because I'm interested in changing the eating habits, the physical activity, and now we're moving a little bit into sleep because we know sort of the intersection of all those health behaviors, they, they really play together. Um, but the three takeaway points, and actually I'm really going to focus on two to keep this a little bit brief, is that sustained behavior change. So in order for me to change a health behavior, whether it's physical activity or diet, you need a physically supportive environment and you need a socially supportive environment. So while I can take someone out of their context and maybe give them treatment in a very clinical way, that's going to do nothing for them when they go back into that context. And so how is it that we can now change the environment in which people are enacting those health behaviors to make them really more supportive? So that's what I'm really going to focus on. Obviously, one needs to acquire the behavioral skills in order to enact those behaviors, but I'm not really going to talk about that. There's a lot of evidence, and I'm happy to, to um, talk individually with anybody about that. So um, I'm, what I'm going to do is present a couple of different studies, but I want to show the study design because I know study designs can differ across fields. Most of what we do, or what I do, are randomized control trials. And so, as you can see from the figure, you essentially screen a family for eligibility, complete the baseline assessment, and then randomize them to one of two, or maybe three or four conditions, depending on your research question. Then you follow up with assessments at post-intervention, and then if you have enough funding, do long-term follow-up. The same is true for what are called cluster randomized control trials. So this is where we're focusing more of our efforts now. So as opposed to randomizing families or individuals to treatment conditions, we randomize organizations or settings to conditions. And the two examples I'm going to give you are randomizing stores to intervention conditions and randomizing restaurants to intervention conditions. And the whole idea is that in order for us to see change at an individual level, so within customers in restaurants or grocery stores, and not have contamination, I need to randomize the entire setting to a particular condition so anybody that's coming into that setting either gets exposed or not to that intervention. Hopefully, um, if anybody has questions for clarity, please let me know. So here's the first intervention that I'm going to describe. This was uh, funded by NCI as an R01. It was actually a, the second study. We did an R21 first, developed a proof of concept, found some intervention effects, and then they gave us um, f funding to be able to do this with a larger network of stores. So what did we do? We did so to, in order to create a physically supportive environment, we had to change what was available in those stores. So we did a structural change intervention. We, uh, we, had to, we wanted to train uh, store staff so they could implement the intervention but also sustain it once, we, uh, once the funding was no longer there and we were no longer involved. And then we used basic principles of marketing to really push the intervention out to um, people. Essentially, the, what the evidence shows is that you can create a physically supportive environment, but unless you have sort of that push-pull to increase someone's motivation to enact the behavior, you're probably not going to get it. So it isn't enough just to create the environment and expect people to change. You need that interplay. So that's the whole point of the marketing campaign. So this study, what we d among the things that we did, was try to make fresh produce more accessible and more available to people. So this was working primarily with small stores, um, not a whole lot of healthy foods in these stores, trying to make them easier to acquire and consume. Because everybody, no matter what income level, are always looking for convenience. Um, that's why we gravitate toward the unhealthy foods, the unhealthy snacks. 
The other thing we did was also change the prepared food environment. So in a lot of these stores, and this is very typical in particularly new immigrant receiving communities where we started this research, and I started this research when I was in North Carolina, a lot of these families go to these stores for everything. So they would also see prepared food. So what we were trying to do is anywhere you went into that store, you had an opportunity to be exposed to and have available healthy options. Um, this picture just depicts some of the training that we did with store employees. So we wanted them to be also agents of change in that environment. And then again, sustain it once we were gone. And then on the uh, right side for you, just some examples of some of the marketing campaigns. That long thing is called an aisle violator, terrible word for it. But essentially what it does is it, it, it fits like this so it violates your eye, your vision, so that it forces you to stop there and look at what might be available. So what did we see? Well, obviously, if we want to change the environment in order to get changes within customers, we have to make sure that the environment does change. So what we found in this case, if you just look on the bottom row, is that we did increase the availability of vegetables, which for us was really good. We obviously wanted to see some changes in fruit, which we actually did not. Um, but we did see changes in vegetables. And for us, that was good because if you look at consumption patterns, especially in this population, you see that Latinos almost meet dietary guidelines for fruit, but they don't meet them for vegetables. Um, and so that was good that we were able to see that. And then, again, remember, this is only really changing the environment. We really didn't have any one-on-one -on -one contact with anybody. If you follow this black line, you'll see that we had an increase of one daily serving of fruits and vegetables. So that's about a cup. And the public health implications of that are pretty huge when you multiply that by the number of people who may be exposed to that um, intervention. So while we only recruited a small subset of those customers to evaluate these changes, these changes are based on customers who were recruited into these, at, at these stores and then followed over a period of time um, being able to see that just by changing that environment and having a marketing campaign, we actually see increases in consumption of fruits and vegetables. So raw for us and the reason um, why we get money for this. So um, the, where we've now translated, or where we've moved this research, and I don't have results, this is actually a study that's currently in progress, is the Kids' Choice Restaurant Program. So we know based on statistics that the amount of money that people spend on prepared foods, specifically in what we call away from home foods, restaurant foods, has increased dramatically. Again, convenience, cost, and whatnot. And so we said, okay, let's change what's available in this environment and well, as well. What we, we had done a bunch of audits based on some restaurants that we systematically enumerated, systematically uh, randomly sampled, and found that in these independent restaurants, there was only healthy menus on probably 15% of those menus and the kids' menus. Here is a very typical example of what we'd see in a child menu. So for those of you who can't see it, junior, Johnny's Junior Meals, Everything comes with a small drink. The, usually the small drink is soda, full sugar soda. But just look at this. And no matter what entree you had, you would have fry, uh, fries and cheese with that. And so what we did is, can we change what's available on those restaurants and then lead to changes in what kids are consuming? So that's an intervention that's currently underway and we'll have some results probably by the end of this um, semester. Where we're going now with this research, and this is why I wanted to put a, uh, put a plug in this, is we just got funding from NICHD, one of the National Child, an Institute for Child Health and Human Development, to use eye tracking in these restaurants, um, sorry, in grocery stores to see what kids and parents are looking at. And this is a project where me and Iana Castro are working on. So I think I have to stop, huh? Oh my gosh, I can't believe how fast that went. Okay, so. <laughs> Socially supportive environment, we're working with families, trying to make those changes. I won't go into that. But we did get intervention effects, so really trying to change that family environment. And now we're going to start working with dads to try and address the issue of spousal interference. So. Th thank you, Susan. I don't, had don't no leave. idea. Don't have, no, no, we should, <laughs> this is, even, this is, even in I talk fast. This is what we call a timer. Yeah. Uh, so um, what we'll do now is we'll take questions for Suchi. Again, we're going to bring the microphone to you because it records the questions as well. 
So let's go over your time limit and explain that spousal interference. That looked really fascinating for the half a second it was up there. Yeah, exactly. So what we did in one of our last studies was really, we, we tried to do in that, that study that I wasn't able to describe was a socially supportive environment. So we were trying to, most interventions where they're trying to address the issue of childhood obesity generally just involves the mom. And we said, she's not the only decision maker in the home. We need to involve the dad. And so we tried to in this study, and with some success, we were able to do it. Um, but in that process, we also wanted to better understand how each of the, the spouses perceives their source of influence. And what we found is that the moms really reported a high degree of interference by the dad in terms of sh her being able to make changes. And we h had heard this over and over again qualitatively in focus groups, but never really assessed it quantitatively. So this is what we have a grant that's uh, going under, uh, gonna be resubmitted, got a great score from NICHD, but didn't get funded, to be able to do a co-parenting intervention. And this is with Allison Shapiro in the uh, uh, College of Education. And so the idea is, can we change the way families work together around food so that we can again create a more socially supportive environment. Because just working with the moms, we're finding we don't see those sustained changes. And this is especially true in this community because uh, what we see is that it's the dad who is usually controlling the pocketbook when they're in the grocery store, when they're in the restaurant, and often informing then what is being purchased. And so if we don't involve him in that process of change, the families are not going to sustain those changes. Sand, or? I'm eating an apple, so oh, okay. I get first <laughs> dibs. Um, just wondering how you're going to uh, globalize this thing, or that's not within your uh, realm. No, yeah. I would love to globalize. And I actually was invited to attend a dissemination implementation workshop sponsored by NIH last summer, which is all about how do you translate these evidence-based interventions into practice. So basically what I was told is it, it's not quite ready for prime time. We need to finish the analyses. But then the idea is to partner with various organizations, whether it would be health departments, who are essentially charged by CDC to create healthy environments, or potentially working with the Neighborhood Market Association, Convenience Store Association, to see if we can get disseminate it um, nationally, which would be our goal. But all the program officers said, wait, get your outcome papers out, and then apply for the funding. So we'll follow their advice. Suchi, I've always heard that stores make more money off of the junk food. So I would think there would be financial consequences, and I'm surprised you got the buy-in from these markets, yeah. especially a small market that may have a small margin. Yeah. It's interesting, they, but at, it's sort of our perception of that. So what we did, we actually did some uh, through with Robert Wood Johnson funding, we did a bunch of interviews across the country, in four different places in the country with food food distributors and with store managers. And what we found is that actually produce is the highest revenue generator, but they know that the unhealthy food is what attracts people there. So interestingly, what we found with all of these um, for-profit is they're actually more open than non-for-profits, whether it's a school or a child care center, whatever, to change, because they're innovators. So that's why I love working with them, because they're like, we'll try it. We might not keep it if it doesn't work for us, but we'll try it. And so they actually, we just submitted an R01 to NIH on Friday, and they, we, they, we got 35 letters of support from stores that were willing to, for us to change what was available in the cash register and the end caps in stores near schools. So we're now really targeting where kids get that food, because the st recent statistics show that kids consume about 500 calories in one visit to a store after school. That represents over th a third, almost a half of the daily caloric intake that they should have. And that's just one occasion. So, and I think there's movement in USDA and other federal agencies that we need to change these food environments and sort of the combination of with them being innovators, it's working for us. So, so, so far they haven't kicked us out. All right. Well, thank you, Suchi. Thank that's you. Fantastic.